Hello, hello. My name is uh, Jones, and uh, today we are going to look at uh, jaundice. We are going to discuss uh, jaundice in this session by looking at the definition. So, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to define jaundice. You should be able to talk about the risk factors uh, to jaundice. You should be able to explain the pathophysiology of uh, jaundice. You should be able to state uh, the different types of jaundice okay but is according to the pathophysiology that we are going to give you you should be able to de uh, describe um, three types of jaundice we are going to talk about the signs and symptoms of jaundice and then we we'll also look at the medical management nursing diagnosis that uh, are related to jaundice and then uh, we'll end by looking at the nursing management of jaundice so to begin this lesson, jaundice is a symptom or a syndrome that is characterized by increased bilirubin concentration in blood. The other definition of uh, jaundice is that it is the yellow color of skin and a mucous membrane due to accumulation of bile, pigment in blood, and their deposition in a body tissue. So when you are trying to define jaundice, we are just looking at jaundice as the yellowish discoloration of the skin, uh, mucous membrane, and the sclera. Of course, this will come because of build-up of, of uh, bilirubin. So that's why jaundice uh, sometimes is called hyperbilirubinemia. Okay, so that is uh, the definition of uh, jaundice. Okay, so... It is also important that we learn to distinguish uh, jaundice from um, uh, conditions like cholestasis, uh, calotinemia, and quinacline injection. So, in, when you talk of, uh, let's say, cholestasis, okay, um, it refers to decreased rate of bowel flow. So, depending on the situation, a jaundice and cholestasis may coexist or each may exist without the other. Although many sources uh, confidently say that uh, jaundice can be recognized when uh, the cellum bilirubin rises to 2 to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter, experienced clinician often cannot see a yellow skin coloration, not until the cellum bilirubin is at least 7 to 8 milligrams per deciliter. So, cholestasis is necessarily one of those conditions uh, that may coexist with a jaundice or one of them may exist on their own. And when you're looking at cholestasis, we are just referring to decreased rate of bowel flow. Okay, so jaundice should also be distinguished from uh, the yellow or green skin color that result from calotinemia or quinacrine injection. Okay, so when one eats large uh, quantities of green and yellow vegetables, uh, tomatoes or yellow corn, may result in excess carotin intake. The resultant yellow skin uh, color is uh, differentiated from jaundice by the absence of yellow color in the mucous membrane and the sclera. Okay, so the urine in this condition will also be normal, and the accentuation of yellow-brown carotenoid uh, pigment uh, in the palm, soles, and the nasal folds can be seen when uh, someone has calotinemia. Okay, so we see this mostly during harvest of maize or well, harvest of corn when uh, people try to eat so much meat and then uh, or try to eat so much of maize and then they may have this yellowish uh, discoloration within the palm. Okay, but um, it's different from uh, from uh, jaundice, okay? In that uh, this one it may come because of increased uh, carotene intake, okay? Or excessive uh, carotene intake. Okay, then quinacrine commonly used, uh, commonly used for treatment of uh, gidiasis may produce a yellow skin color, but the urine will remain normal. Serum bilirubin levels are normal in uh, patients with uh, yellow skin that is caused by carotinemia or quinacrine. So, um, this is another condition in which um, when you are treating someone for gidiasis, 
you, they may have this yellow skin coloration, not necessarily uh, as jaundice, uh, okay, but because of the presence of uh, this chemical, which is um, uh, quinacline. Okay, so jaundice has uh, some classifications that we also need to understand for the purpose of also understanding the pathophysiology. We need to appreciate these. Um, we need to appreciate these classifications. Okay, so there is um, hemolytic. Okay, that is hemolytic, hemolytic type of jaundice, or there's hemolytic. Then there's hepatocellular, and then there's obstructive. So these are the different classification of jaundice. Okay, so you know we'll try to talk about the other types, but others will talk about these classifications um, as the also types of jaundice that there's hemolytic jaundice, there's a, uh, there's a patocellular jaundice, or there's a obstructive. Necessarily, what we mean hemolytic is coming from hemolysis of blood cells. Then hepatocellular, it is coming because of pathogens within, or because of um, problems with the liver, because of pathogenesis to do with the liver, or having hepato, um, having a problem with the liver. Then obstructive is happening because there is an obstruction in the flow of uh, bilirubin, okay, which is um, uh, so, which is the so culprit for causing jaundice. Okay, so we are looking at the classification. So there is hemolytic, hepatocellular, or obstructive. So when you are now looking at the risk factors, we can try to look at these factors based on these same, uh, based on these same uh, classification. So when we say risk factors, we can say hemolytic jaundice, some of the risk factors will come because of transfusion reaction. The risk factors may come because of hemolytic anemia. The risk factors of this jaundice may come because of severe bends, which causes, um, uh, which causes increased breakdown of red blood cells. Then um, other risk factors to do with hemolytic jaundice have to do with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Okay, so autoimmune diseases that may cause um, hemolysis of uh, red blood cells may cause hemolytic uh, jaundice. Okay, so when you're looking at this classification, okay, classification as hemolytic, classification as a petrocellular or obstructive, so we can say there's hemolytic jaundice, okay, there's hepatocellular jaundice, and then there's obstructive uh, jaundice. Okay, so when there's hepatocellular jaundice, this will be due to pathology that affects the liver. So we have hepatitis, which is inflammation of the liver, so this can lead to jaundice. We have yellow fever in which there is inflammation of the liver, so this can lead to jaundice. We have alcoholism, which can lead to problems with the liver, so this may lead to jaundice. And the type of classification will be called uh, uh, hepatocellular jaundice. Okay, so then we have obstructive jaundice. In obstructive jaundice, we can have um, extra hepatic or intra hepatic. Okay, so when I say extra, uh, extra hepatic, this is obstruction that may be caused by bowel duct plugging from gallstone, an inflammatory process, tumor or pressure from an enlarged gland. Then when I say intrahepatic, this can come because of obstruction from pressure on channels from inflamed liver tissue or exudates. So within the liver, if there's inflammation, then we are saying it is going to lead to intrahepatic. Then extrahepatic, we are saying obstruction that may be caused by bowel duct plugging from more gallstones or, or an inflammation process. It can even be tumor or pressure from an enlarged gland. So this may cause mechanical obstruction. Okay, so talking about types or classification of jaundice, you can talk of obstructive jaundice, you can talk of hepatocellular jaundice, and then you can also talk of hemolytic jaundice. So these are the risks according to the classification, uh, classification type of jaundice. Okay, so if you have to talk about the pathophysiology of jaundice, 
you know pathophysiology starts with etiology it starts with the causology it starts with what necessarily has led to the jaundice so in the pathophysiology if you want to explain hemolytic jaundice okay so it will be caused by increased deep destruction of lead blood cells resulting in the in the in, in the inability to excrete bilubin as quickly as it forms then when you're talking of pathophysiology due to hepatocellular uh, jaundice this it means it is resulting from inability of diseased liver cell to clear normal amounts of bilubin because of defective uptake consumption or transport mechanism so in the pathophysiology for hepatocellular it is resulting from the inability of the liver in the pathophysiology to do with hemolytic there is increased destruction of red blood cells then if you want to explain the other third way of explaining the pathophysiology of uh, jaundice is to do with obstruction jaundice so this will come because there are is some obstruction in bowel disposition okay so cause mostly easy obstruction in the bowel disposition so mucous membrane screla who are going to have the yellowish or the tinge of jaundice because there is an obstruction in the flow of jaundice so this is now deposited in the skin mucous membrane and the, the sclera okay so it is important to know that jaundice is a symptom of an underlying condition that impairs the excretion of bilirubin uh, from the body so when you're looking at this hepatocellular uh, when you're looking at this obstructive jaundice we have a condition which is coming because of the risk factors to do with the obstruction okay so now let me try to explain a bit of pathophysiology of jaundice using one angle okay that is it. talking about hemolytic uh, jaundice i'm going to explain the pathophysiology of jaundice using the hemolytic angle or classification so as the 120 day lifespan of uh, lead blood cells comes to an end or the cell becomes damaged the cell membranes become weak and susceptible to rupture as this old or damaged cell circulates through the reticular endothelial system the fragile membrane eventually ruptures and the content of the cell are expelled into the bloodstream one of the cellular components that is released when this happens is hemoglobin which is ingested by phagocytic cells called macrophages this phagocytosis spreads the hemoglobin into constituent hem and the globin uh, portions the globin portion is a protein that breaks down into amino acids and plays no role in the pathogenesis of jaundice. Okay, then on the other hand, when talk of the hem, okay, it undergoes an oxidation reaction that is catalyzed by enzyme oxygenase to give bilirubin iron and carbon monoxide the bilirubin is a green colored pigment which then undergoes a reduction reaction to yield a yellow pigment called bilirubin this reaction is catalyzed by cytosolic enzyme bilirubin reductase so nearly about four milligrams of bilirubin for each four gram of blood is produced in the body every day mainly as a result of hem from expired red blood cells being broken down the remainder is produced necessarily from other sources of hem such as failed lead blood cell synthesis and from the breakdown of proteins that contain hem such as cytochrome and myoglobin so this insoluble bilirubin that is referred to as free indirect or unconjugated bilirubin and okay is going to move towards the river through the bloodstream and it picks on and it is 
picked or it is bound to albumin. So when then it reaches the liver, bilirubin is conjugated with gluconic acid. Or we can say it is characterized, it is catalyzed by UDP gluconeal transferase. When this process happens, it will give bilirubin a digluconite. Or we are now going to say the bilirubin has now been conjugated. Okay, so when now bilirubin is conjugated, it becomes water soluble. Okay, so before the bilirubin leaches the liver, it is in the unconjugated form. And unconjugated form of bilirubin is fat soluble. But after it passes through the liver, after it passes, it passes through conjugation, Okay, it becomes water soluble uh, form which is, can easily be excreted. So the conjugated bilirubin then will leave the liver and enter the biliary tree and the cystic ducts as part of bowel. Okay, so they now enter in the biliary tree and the cystic duct as a part of bowel. Okay, so when they are now released in the intestine, they are converted. Okay, so the, they are, when uh, they are released now in the intestine, the bacteria in the intestine will then convert the bilirubin into yellow Okay, so from the biliary tree, uh, the, bil the bilirubin is now going to be deposited in the duodenum. So when it is deposited there in the duodenum, okay, which is a part of the, the small intestine or the first part of the small intestine, okay, it will then be converted by the activities of the bacteria within the intestine, okay, into urobilinogen. This urobilinogen is either converted into, into stecobilinogen and then when it is converted into stecobilinogen, it will be excreted in feces. Okay, and it will be, it can also be, this urobilinogen can be reabsorbed by the intestinal cells and taken, okay, and taken within the blood and excreted via the kidneys, okay, via the kidneys in the urine and be able to give urine its color. Okay, so this is necessarily what happens when I'm in the normal conjugation of of bilirubin. So now, if at all there is a fault within this uh, this conjugation process of bilirubin, or then jaundice is going to result, okay, and it is going to cause the yellowish discoloration of the skins of the skin, nail bed, and the whites of the eyes, okay, which you call the screla, okay, and there will be build up of uh, bilirubin in uh, body tissues. So, when you are looking at this uh, process of uh, the, the conjugation of bilirubin, our uh, metabolism of bilirubin, we can simply establish that there are different types of jaundice. Okay, and when you're looking at these types here, we are looking at the level at which it is happening. So, the different types of jaundice, according to the level at which it is happening, we can say prehepatic jaundice. Okay, so prehepatic jaundice is going to result into increased levels of unconjugated bilirubin in blood. Then we have hepatocellular jaundice. Okay, it is also going to lead to increased levels of unconjugated bilirubin. Okay, because there is a problem there to do with the liver. So then the other type, according to the level, okay, that is the level which is bringing about the jaundice is the post-hepatic jaundice. And when you talk of post-hepatic jaundice, mostly is it, it is obstructive jaundice. Or the risk factors that we have discussed because of obstructive jaundice are going to result. Okay, so in discussing about the types about of jaundice according to the level, so we are saying pre-hepatic jaundice, in here, the bilirubin level is disrupted is disrupted prior to the transportation of blood to the liver okay so this bilirubin which is supposed to be carried by albumin okay which is a form of transport to the liver so there is a disruption in the transportation so examples of conditions okay that will come 
uh, because of this, uh, where we have the pre-hepatic type of uh, jaundice, is um, hemolytic anemia and sickle cell disease. So in this condition, someone may have pre-hepatic jaundice. Okay, then we have hepatocellular jaundice. Here, the disrupted bilirubin is caused by the disease of the liver. And examples of conditions that may cause this hepatocellular jaundice include liver cirrhosis and Gilbert syndrome. Then um, we have post-hepatic jaundice or obstructive jaundice. Here, bowel and the bilirubin are contained inside and it is obstructed and prevented from draining into the digestive system from the gallbladder. So examples that may cause obstructive jaundice or post-hepatic jaundice okay, may include tumors and the gallstones. Okay, so you can even try to add this within the pathophysiology that is to do with these types according to the level at which the jaundice has been caused. Okay, so now let us look at um, the clinical manifestations or we look at the signs and the symptoms. This will be based on the assessment that can be done. So the signs and symptoms that can be seen in jaundice include dark, foamy urine due to increased bowel in the urine. Okay, so remember the urobilinogen, which is absorbed by intestinal cells, okay, is now then excreted in the urine. So you're going to have dark, uh, dark foamy urine that is due to increased uh, bowel in the urine. Then um, we have light or day color uh, or clay colored stool, which is due to lack of bowel in the in the bowel, okay, or in the small bowel. Then uh, presence of jaundice within the skin okay may cause prolitis okay so bowel acids when they are in high amount or they, when there's increased um, amount of bowel salts in the skin it leads to prolitis then um, we have um, the other symptoms or signs and symptoms here that you can see is inability to tolerate fatty foods okay because bowel is involved in the emulsification of fats in the small intestine. So a uh, person may now not tolerate, uh, uh, may not tolerate fatty foods, okay? Then there is mild to severe illness with the other symptoms such as anorexia, fatigue, nausea, and weakness, and uh, possibly weight loss. Okay, so these can be seen when one has the jaundice. Then uh, in the medical management, okay, so when you discuss the, the classification, we said it can be hemolytic jaundice, it can be hepatocellular or obstructive. So in the medical management, you are going to treat this patient based on the cause or the predisposition. Okay, so what would be some of the nursing diagnoses? Okay, so some of the nursing diagnoses that we can appreciate for a patient with jaundice is a disturbed body image, which is related to jaundice. Okay, there's yellowish discoloration, discoloration of the skin, they also the screla. So there will be a distorted body image or this disturbed body image, which is related to, to jaundice. Then there can be impaired skin integrity, which is related to hyperbilirubinemia. Okay, this is because the person is going to have um, is going to have prolitis, which will cause him or her to be scratching him or herself. So this may affect skin integrity. Okay, so how do you manage this uh, condition as a nurse? You can assess and document the degree of jaundice of the skin and the sclera and then intervene to reduce anxiety, reinforce the healthcare provider's explanation about uh, the cause and expected outcome of jaundice. And then you can also encourage the client to express feelings and concerns that they may have about their body image and advise some of the remedies that they can use like increased glucose you can, or high carbohydrate uh, diet, okay, which will help in the breakdown of 
um, of bilirubin. So you can also promote adequate nutrition, okay, to the patient, and also encourage consistency, okay, and reduce on protein intake, okay, reduce on protein intake as advised by the health practitioner, okay. This is um, necessarily um, recommended to avoid the certain complications that may come, okay. So. Today we have been uh, looking at jaundice, okay? Jaundice as a, as a symptom, okay? Uh, that is necessarily what we have been looking at. So jaundice is seen uh, or is mostly discussed in, um, let's say, neonates, where neonates, because they are born with um, a higher HB, so they may tend to have hemolytic jaundice. Okay, hemolytic jaundice because the increased red blood cells that they are born with are not necessarily needed when they are now uh, able to enjoy atmospheric hair. So after some few three to five days, these may, uh, may be broken down. Okay, so we see jaundice for people that abuse alcohol. Okay, so due to liver damage, they may have jaundice. That is to do with adults. So in liver ciliosis, we may see jaundice, okay, as a condition. So in our discussion, we discussed that jaundice is the yellow color of the skin and mucous membrane that is due to accumulation of, of a bowel pigment in the blood and the deposition of uh, this bow in the body tissues okay then um in our discussion we distinguished jaundice from a condition like cholestasis that may bring a similar clinical presentation of yellowish discoloration of the skin but may not have other signs and symptoms to do with um, uh, clay type of uh, stool that might be seen or uh, foamy urine or dark urine that is seen in jaundice okay and also when you talk of crestasis uh, the bilirubin levels do not necessarily increase that much but when you're talking of jaundice you see that um, bilirubin levels may increase to more than two or 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. So it may increase to that, but mostly clinically, we tend to see the yellowish discoloration of jaundice when um, the jaundice is, uh, or, or when the bilirubin levels are above six milligrams per deciliter, or it's between seven to eight milligrams per deciliter. That's when we tend to see the, uh, the yellowish discoloration of the skin. Then we also distinguished um, uh, distinguished uh, jaundice from calotinemia. You know, when you're eating a lot of calots, you get it, then um, they will be increased calotin intake. This may result in yellow uh, skin color, but this can still be differentiated from jaundice because of the absence of yellow color in mucous membrane and the sclera. Okay, so or, or the normal urine will be seen in this, in this condition. Okay, then um, quinacline injection, okay, which is used for treatment of gidiasis, may produce a yellow skin, but the urine is going to remain normal. Serum bilirubin levels also are going to remain normal. So we try to distinguish uh, these uh, a condition that may have a clinical presentation similar to that of jaundice. Then we looked at risk factors. Risk factors that we looked at were classified under were classified under hemolytic, hepatocellular, and obstructive, which can be looked at classes of jaundice or types of jaundice, uh, depending on the write-up um, that you might be using. Okay, but otherwise these are necessary classes classification of jaundice. Okay, based on the cause. Okay, so the cause hemolytic jaundice it can be transfusion or destruction in the uh, red blood cells. Then uh, hepatocellular conditions of the liver. Obstructive 
these two types we have extrahepatic and intrahepatic extrahepatic anything that is happening before or after the the liver so it's outside the liver system so obstruction may be caused by bowel duct plugging in from gallstones so that will cause extrahepatic type of jaundice then um, we we have discussed the pathophysiology that Depending on these three classification, hemolytic, obstructive, okay, obstructive or hepatocellular, we can uh, we can discuss the pathophysiology of jaundice. Okay, so in our example of pathophysiology that we looked at, we picked the angle of hemolytic. Okay, hemolytic to do with the destruction of lead blood cells and necessarily what is going to result um, after this destruction okay then uh, within our lesson we went on to look at how jaundice may come due to pre-hepatic reasons due to hepatic reasons and post-hepatic reasons then we also said that in the treatment we are going to treat according to the cause of the jaundice that's the way we are going to treat it and then we identified some problems that may come or be, be associated to to jaundice so these are the nursing diagnosis or nursing problems that may be associated to jaundice that we have discussed in here okay then uh, we discussed just a few points on the nursing care that we can give uh, to this patient so from me i'm saying thank you very much and i keep studying